You're deliberately seeking out opinions that reinforce your views? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I call it the failing New York Times. Every story they write is a hit job. Don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains... Wait a minute. Alternative that facts? Is it really true that we all live in our own echo chambers? Fake news and the filter bubble, post-truth and alternative facts... Are we all, as President Obama put it, absorbing an entirely different reality? News organizations have been in a bad way lately, laying off staff left, right and center, just when arguably we need them most. But traditional media still largely sets the political agenda. And if these turbulent times do have a silver lining, it's been the resurgent interest in journalism over the past couple of years, even at the supposedly failing New York Times. On the other hand, there's also growing support for a countervailing worldview in which the mainstream media, or MSM, run by a small coordinated elite, simply can't be trusted. At its most extreme, this worldview sees the press as the enemy of the people. You're listening to Polarised, the podcast from the RSA that's all about trying to understand the forces driving us further apart. Are they real and what can be done about them? It's presented by Ian Leslie, that's me, and Matthew Taylor. That's me. In this episode, we're asking, is our sense of a shared reality becoming even more fragile? And is fragmentation of the media the cause or just a symptom of our polarised politics? Coming up, we'll be talking to Silvia Majo Vasquez from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford. But before we get started, you've made it this far through this series, so we thought it was about time we gave you a glimmer of hope about our politics. Um, I'm going to talk, talk about an idea that might help bring the country back together again. Matthew, you think we need another referendum. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, I mean, my view about what's going to happen changes all the time. And, and actually, I, I kind of think that uh, Theresa May may well get uh, her way, that the European Union will give her uh, the kind of look that she's uh, got a victory and that the British people will take what she produces partly out of just sheer exhaustion. But that may not happen. It may be that the majority view which at the moment, which is the European Union won't give her what she wants and the people will be very unhappy and, and that in, the intractability we've got will deepen. Now, in those circumstances, I advocated last December a referendum with three choices because there are three positions now. The reason we're in the, this intractable place is that there's a Brexit position, there's an EU negotiated deal position, and there's a Remain position. None of these views have a majority in Parliament. None of these views have a majority in the country. So I said, let's have a referendum with three choices and that people can vote for their first choice and also for their uh, second choice. Now, I made the argument last December. It was a bit of a kind of punt, really. And when I wrote it, uh, the small number of people who read it thought it was slightly bonkers. Then to my surprise... Justin Greening, former minister, wrote in the Times, uh, the solution is to have a three-question referendum. Coincidence? And, and, yeah, and then I a couple not. of days later, the Times did a poll. About a third of people <laughs> said they thought it was a good idea, which isn't bad, considering I think most of them would never have heard of the idea before. So, so yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of out there. Okay. Um, I, I have a couple of questions about this. Uh, it, it sounds interesting, but I, I, one question is not actually mine. It comes from, from Peter Kellner, who... who wrote something about this in, in Prospect. And the second question is mine, uh, and it's a bit blunter. <laughs> but the, let's go with the first one. So, so Peter Kellner's point, and actually we can, we can, I can just quote it because it's pretty straightforward. If three different ways of counting the same votes, all of which can be defended in theory, produce three different winners, then it may be hard to present the outcome as the settled legitimate will of the people. Now, you see, I'm glad you asked me that question <laughs> because I think the answer to that is that we would need to hold some kind of citizens' assembly ahead of the referendum. Now, you might say, well, hang on, this idea is getting even more elaborate. This is but joining two of your hobby horses. It is. Well together. spotted. Well spotted, Ian. 
But in my defence, what I'd say is this. First of all, that's exactly what they did in Ireland. So in Ireland, before they had the referendum on abortion, they had a citizens' assembly to agree with what question would be and what the process would be. They recommended that to the Irish Parliament. The Irish Parliament then I- I- implemented it. And secondly, a very esteemed group of people, uh, including um, uh, David Ronsonman and uh, Jenny Watson from the Electoral Commission, three MPs, produced a report last week from the Constitution Unit. It was an independent commission. And one of the things they said, because this report was about referendum, was before we have them in future, we should have some form of citizens' engagement so that we try to get the question right and we don't have referendums that are just very badly designed like the EU referendum. So uh, Peter Cowan is right, it's complex, which is why I think we'd have to engage citizens helping us to design this and get it right. Okay, I mean, because that was my my second question about about the this three-question structure is it, it is a little bit too, I mean, it, it feels like something that that you know has been cooked up in in a think tank, and policy wants have got together and worked out this incredibly elaborate mechanism. But isn't it basically a you know it's a three wheel car, and no matter what colour you paint it, nobody's going to buy it because it just seems impossibly complicated. And what people are looking for at this point is simplicity. I think on the balance of probability, you're right, Ian. I think you know anything that is as hard to explain as this is trying to like trying to push water uphill. The only thing I'd say is. You know, when all other suspects have been ruled out, then, you know, you have to go to the only remaining possibility. So, you know, that principle, that kind of Sherlock Holmes principle that having removed all other possibilities, however incredible, the only one left is the one. And so I I just don't know if, if, if Theresa May fails in the European Union. If she looks like she's been humiliated, if she comes back with something that that the vast majority of Brexit people don't like. What are we going to do? I mean, I have to say, I, I don't want to sound too um, positive because, you know, I don't want to sort of uh, disrupt the, the mood of the podcast. But I actually think a Citizens' Assembly would be a, a, a great way to tackle this. And because you could frame it as saying, let's, it's time to take this out of the hands of the politicians. You know, they've put us in this mess. Let's, it's now up to us to sort it out. So it's, maybe it's, it's the moment. Well, we'll see. I, I, you know, I, I'm kind of feeling, the ambivalence I feel about this is that, I, I, I kind of, I do, you know, I, I've been I've been backing Theresa May on Brexit for a year now in the sense that I have believed for a year that she's playing quite a skillful hand and that she may in the end land where she wants to land, which is a Brexit which does as little damage as possible. And that was a very unfashionable view for a long time. And now people, it's starting to become a more fashionable view. So in one way, I kind of want her to do that because it may be the least disruptive uh, thing and because I've also, I believed it would happen. On the other hand, I'm not sure. I think we, we, we do go around in circles on this. The Brexiteers and the, the hard Brexiteers and the hard Remainers are going to have a hot summer of trying to persuade people not to support the May deal. So, you know, it's all still up in the air. So we're going to talk about a slightly different kind of polarisation. We, we, we talk about political polarisation, but we're going to ask today, is it accompanied by... Uh, kind of epistemic polarization. Uh, are we are we losing uh, this uh, a sense of shared reality, and are our patterns of media consumption responsible for that? And 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 therefore, are they helping to drive us apart? On the line, we're, we're joined by Sylvia Macho Vasquez, a research fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. Hello, Sylvia. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I just want to start by by talking about the uh, what do we call them the old media, conventional media, legacy media, uh, newspapers. When it comes to the political debate, are they still influential in in, in setting the agenda, or, or, or do stories really kind of bubble up from uh, more likely to bubble up from different new media, social media, and so on? Well, uh, our research uh, here at Reuters and also my previous research when I was based in Spain shows that, yeah, legacy media are still important in setting the agenda and they are very prominent in conversations on social media. It's not only our research, but also this is in line with previous research from other countries that have studied the actual content that circulate around major political events on Twitter, for instance, or on Facebook. And that content very much aligned with the content of major news media outlets, which uh, tends to be legacy media outlets. All right. So, so legacy media are, are are still influential, 
What, what about, so, so digital media like Breitbart in the US or, or, or Guido Fawkes or here, the Canary and so on, mm-hmm. are they, how influential are they in, in the political debate? Well, just for our audience, when we talk about legacy media, we talk about those outlets that were there before the advent of the web, right? Sure. And when we talk about digital born outlets, or at least we call them in, in our area, digital born outlets, are those that were born on the web. So legacy media, we, we in our studies, what we are usually doing is mapping audience behavior online. So we use browsing tracking data. So there is a panel that allows us to uh, track them and they opt in to, to belong to this uh, or to take part on these studies. And we can analyze and we can see how central are legacy media and digital born outlets in the overall news consumption. Legacy media still are very much central in the networks that we can map. And what does it mean? It means that they are the very center of the media diets of audiences online. However, it is also interesting to see that uh, new players, uh, digital born outlets, also play an important role, but very much at the periphery of the networks map that we are uh, modeling. Okay, and and can we just talk uh, uh, about the UK specifically? Because you, you've done uh, research across uh, a few different countries and it would be interesting to see you know in context uh in, in this kind of global context what are the the specific characteristics of UK media consumption and, and, and influence versus other countries? Well, the regulatory framework is uh, an important element in shaping the news consumption online. And we can see in the UK, the public media system has a, a very prominent role. It's very central. The BBC. The BBC, right. When we model online audience behavior, we see that the, the shape of these networks very much matches the, the shape of a star, where in the middle we have the BBC driving news consumption online. Isn't there an age dimension of this? I mean, I, 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 w- I would just imagine that what you're saying describes my world as a middle-aged person, but young people, do they, is the BBC at the, at the centre of their consumption star? Yeah, that's, impo- that's interesting. We haven't fine uh, for the uh, for the UK and now I'm checking some of the results that I presented last week in Chicago in a conference on computational social science and for the case of the BBC we haven't found significant differences across ages mm. we have found significant differences across uh, ages in the US and what we have specifically found in the US is that news consumption is more fragmented in the US for uh, youngest groups but again our results for the UK doesn't show significant uh, findings. So, so just to go before that, just that point, very interesting. Our capacity now to deeply analyse how people consume media is much greater, isn't it? Because in the old days, people would buy a newspaper, but we wouldn't really know uh, what papers, pages they read and whether they went from a news story to an op-ed piece. But you now can track exactly how people meander through these sites and what connections they make. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. I mean, we know much more about the online domain that we used to know about the offline domain, but still the off the line domain is very much important. So it is very fancy to study the online domain and have all of these uh, big data data sets and big data studies. But what about ha- what, what is happening in the offline domain where, for instance, TV channels have multiplied? So our, our research is very much limited. And I'm not saying that it's not informative. It is, of course, but it has some limitations that are important. So one of the things we hear a lot uh, these days, to, to the extent to which it's, it's almost conventional wisdom is that online media has basically created uh, filter bubbles and everybody or everybody lives in their own echo chamber they, they consume the information the news they want to consume um, and they're not exposed to alternative viewpoints and so they become more kind of ideologically polarized and so on have you found evidence for that well uh I have to say that this view is very much shared by uh, by the public and also by 
uh, politicians, but is not so much uh, by social scientists. We do not find uh, strong evidence of uh, echo chambers online when it comes to news consumption. So when we talk about polarization, we have to accurately uh, identify several types of polarization. There is perceived polarization, there is affective polarization. For instance, uh, perceived polarization is uh, how the public perceive other parties or affective polarization is how people feel towards each party. This is a different type of polarization than news consumption polarization or polarization in news consumption. Is Are the audiences selectively consuming uh, news information online? We do not find uh, strong evidence for that. And when I say strong evidence is that because uh, more research is needed, but for the mass public, we do not find that people have segregated news consumption behavior. When it comes to those more interested in politics, when it comes to those more politicized people, they are more selectively consuming news than the general population. But how much uh, these people, I mean, I mean, the portion of the pe these people relative to the overall population, as we know, is relatively tiny, right? I mean, uh, the general population is not as much interested in politics as probably you both and me are interested in politics. So somehow some of the statements related to polarization in, in news media consumption are, from my point of view, based on our evidence, are overstated. So we're... One of the things about the way people consume media online is that they consume news stories out of context. So if I read a story about a cancer risk in the Daily Mail, I kind of know that the Daily Mail has a new cancer risk almost every day, and so I should probably take it with a pinch of salt. But if someone extracts an article online, and I'm not so clear about where it comes from, I can't make that kind of adjustment based upon my knowledge of the context. So when people read things, particularly through Facebook, for example, where they're just reading, a, a, there's a link to a particular article out of its context, you don't know where it's from. Does that reduce our capacity to contextualise uh, news and make it make us more gullible, I suppose? I agree with you on that. I mean, I guess that the uh, cues that we have online to interpret and to process news information are different from those that we have in the offline world. We have a study, and a very interesting study here at the Reuters, where we measure brand awareness on Facebook. We track a panel of people, and, and, and they allowed us, of course, uh, to be tracked, and we identify all the sources and pieces of information they read. Then afterwards, after a week, we asked them, have you read this piece of news? Where have you read it? And they only remember that they read it on Facebook if they remember reading it, right? But they do not remember the brand. Mm. And this is important because brand, uh, uh, I mean, there are several intangible uh, values that brand, news brands add to pieces of information, trustness, quality, and also credibility, right? And this is something that I think Facebook is trying to address by adding this new uh, button where you can click that and you go to Wikipedia and you can browse a little bit of information about that news media outlet. But this is still something that it's, uh, it's very relevant in studying news information, news consumption online. And that seems to me to be a very big issue. I mean, I, I remember... Uh, I'm sure you haven't come across this, but in the in the 80s, there was a, a newspaper called The Sport. Mm -hmm. uh, and The Sport used to have completely made up stories, you know, about... You know, land, like the National Enquirer in the like the, in the National US. Enquirer. Yeah. And, and they were, they didn't pretend they were true, you know, Land Rover found on the moon or it was just, or it was all nonsense. But you read it for entertainment uh, and you didn't take it a bit seriously. But of course, now... Uh, if that was online, people might extract an article like that. You don't know it's appeared in a humorous newspaper just to entertain you. Uh, and that lack of awareness of the place where the pace has come from, that is a problem, isn't it? Yeah, and people are studying fact-checking online. We have here our colleague, uh, Lucas Grave, who is an expert on that. They are, uh, they. I mean, it's uh, many years now that they have been uh, trying to address this situation with social media platforms. And one of the, the ways that they are doing that is by uh, convincing social media platforms of the importance of adding additional cues on pieces of information on, on, on their platforms, where people can say whether this content is contentious or not. And, and this these are new layers of information that social platforms, especially Facebook, uh, who is at the center of this debate, are adding on their content. And I think this is going to help us in the medium term 
to address this situation. But it is still important that we are uh, talking about this because it's an issue. Sylvia, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So Ian, I found that I found that I found Sylvia fascinating. Um, but one thing it reminded me of something you said very early on in this series, which is your worry about the attacks on the BBC. Oh yeah, because Sylvia, I mean, they're, they're, they're Sylvia, and I was surprised yeah. about what she said about young people that the BBC still really matters. And I agree. I think the BBC is the only thing that's standing between us and a full blown culture war. Um, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, listening to, to to what she says there just makes you realise that. that this, this the importance of, of of having a you know very reasonably uh, serious objective broadcaster right in the middle of our of our debate and that even if the number of people who actually listen to it or consume it is relatively small it's still it's like an anchor on a boat it may only be a very small part of the weight of the, the media is. vehicle but it's yeah. the thing that keeps the stability that's uh, really interesting anyway before we go every polarized episode ends with um, a little provocation something we've read that's maybe shifted the way that we look uh, at the world and uh, Ian I think there's something that's tickled your fancy yeah uh, really interesting article uh, uh, online at, at quillette.com it's by a couple of Cambridge PhD students Vincent Harinam and Rob Henderson and they they pull together a, a few sources to to make a really interesting argument which is that in a sense and it's mainly us focused by the way but but it's it's got implications for for here as well in a sense politics can get disproportionately dominated by partisans and extremists and actually polarization uh, is it, sort of exaggerated so 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 you look at the kind of way people line up on uh, along party lines especially in the US and you think wow everybody's really partisan and extremist and what these guys argue is that you, there's only a relatively small number of voters who are actually really partisan and and ideologically driven but the moderates go, just go along with whatever the most dominant voices on their side are saying. So uh, in sociological terms, the mo- moderates tend to sort of falsify their, their preferences. So if the, if the if a loud minority say this is what the, the view, you know, this is the line, then the moderates, because they are moderate essentially, <laughs> just go, OK, well, if that's the thing I'm supposed to believe about this particular uh, aspect of politics, I'm sure, uh, you know, I, I, I'll go along with that and I'll tick that box whatever. So in other words, a small number of highly inflexible individuals determine how a society is run. They, they look at it beyond politics. You can see that in lots of, lots of different areas. Um, so, you know, you have these committed ideologues who are unshakable in their beliefs, and then these moderates who basically sort of adopt their, their preferences without really feeling that, 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 that belief strongly um, to, to this intransigent minority. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting argument. I, th- I think it is, and it, it actually confirms other research. I think Cass Sunstein wrote a book about this some time ago, the American uh, kind of public intellectual about, uh, he argued that, you know, when we say that participation, political participation and debate uh, is a good thing, actually, if it's a debate where uh, it is dominated by one side, people will become more extreme, which is why it is things like, you know, my hobby horse, citizens assemblies, they're constructed to have a full range of opinions because there is exactly this process that goes on. If people are broadly in the same position, they will then be moved to the extreme. But the other thing it really made me think of is the importance of moderates being vigilant. You know, so if moderates realise that there is this kind of inherent dynamic, and it took me back to my new Labour days. You know, I think that people forget maybe about the kind of the Blair years, that one of the bits of what what made New Labour so successful uh, as a kind of campaigning machine was a group of people who worked very hard, and they were very tough, pretty ruthless, to make to smash the left of the Labour Party at that stage, and to kind of so they were they were warriors for the moderate position. People like John Crudders, Pat McFadden, Tom Watson. I met these people who are now kind of middle aged doyens of the Labour Party as young people whose day to day job was making sure that you know Blair never lost a vote to the left at the conference and stuff like that. So they used the kind of tactics you might associate with momentum to win the moderate position. It doesn't come naturally to moderates to fight. If they don't, they lose. 
Absolutely. And the, the other interesting thing that, and they get onto this towards the end of the piece, is they say one one kind of effect of the fact that people will kind of falsify their their preferences and go along with what the loudest voices are saying, is that you can end up in situations where collectively the group takes a decision that nobody in the group actually wants. Right. This is known as the Abilene paradox. You can look it up on on Wikipedia. And although they don't mention this, I actually heard. This talked about in the context of, of gang violence. It's sometimes called group stupidity by, by people that study gang violence. And what happens is, you know, a group of guys are sitting around at home and one of the guys who wants to kind of make a bit of a boastful statement says, hey, why don't we go and kill that guy down the road? And another guy, because he also wants to look like he's a big guy, says, yeah, let's go and do that. And then everybody says you know let's go, because nobody wants to lose face by saying mm. hey, maybe that's not a good idea and they end up going going even though none of them actually really wanted to do that they end up doing it and so you have this kind of situation where unless people are prepared to kind of lose face or or, or end up in a in some sort of an argument or so on where they just go along with the majority then you have these amazing situations where collectively a group whether it's a you know group of guys at home or, or a political party or a nation uh you know not going to mention Brexit here, but here, here I did actually decide on doing something that, that uh, nobody originally wanted to 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 do, but everybody now feels that they are locked into in, into executing. So I think uh, that's possibly a, ne- a nice segue into a future polarized program because I think one of the things Ian, you and I have wanted to talk about is anger and yeah. and the role of anger. And I think one of the things we want to get into in that conversation about anger is the problem with anger is, is anger unequally spread as a resource? That is to say, it's just much easier to mobilise anger. You might argue there's nothing wrong with anger per se. It's just that it seems particularly to be a tone of voice that's easier to adopt at the extremes and in the middle. So that's that's something we can look into. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Uh, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review in your podcast app. Polarised uh, was presented by Ian Leslie and me, Matthew Taylor. The producer was James Shield, and we were brought to you by the RSA. RSA.